Greetings. This is um, a kind of opening lecture for the Sector 39 2023 Permaculture Design course. Permaculture has built into it a set of ethics. And actually, it's a difficult subject to explore in many ways. You, you don't get to tell other people what their values are. Um, and yet, it seems very important to us that we're clear about what our values are because we want to build a consensus to work together. So this is an exploration of the permaculture ethics. And look, if these don't speak to you, if this doesn't work for you, you know, maybe permaculture isn't for you. But I suspect if you go with us to the end of this, you'll find that it very much is. Um, so here's an, uh, uh, an opening definition of permaculture. To me, it's three things. There's three areas of, of consideration to come up with the de definition of permaculture. And the first one is it's guided by a set of ethics. And if we, the feeling is, the understanding is, if we can come together uh, with those ethics, it, in some ways that gives us a, a long-term steering mechanism. It's it's like, the, yeah, as I say, the thing that guides us to achieve long-term goals. And I think without a kind of a unifying concept from the outset, uh, we're not going to be able to achieve those goals. So this is a this lecture is an invitation to sort of to to buy in to understand the permaculture ethics and to really make them your own, because as I've said already, it's not this is not very much not about telling people what to do or what to think or what their values are. It's about finding common ground. So I won't go into this too much but let's let's say our definition of permaculture is well it's the relationship between three things it's these ethics it's a set of principles and those principles are derived from observing nature kind of asks the question if we allow nature to be our teacher what do we learn or what are the what are the principles that we can um if you decode from from nature from natural systems and the third part of the course, and the third part of the definition, and very much the third part of the course, is design tools. So agriculture is a set of ideas and principles, but the key question is, we want to use these to manifest change in the world. So as we go through the course, we're also, um, if you like, building up our toolkit to enable us to make the changes that we want to make. So permaculture is a set of tools and strategies for solving problems. It's, it's guided by a clear set of ethics. It's informed by a set of principles derived from observ observations of nature. And it's activated by a practical set of design tools. There we go. So that's what we'll be. Uh, that's the journey we're on. How do I get out of this? Oops. Um, And I think that's right. So ethics in permaculture. This is this sort of the steering mechanism, the the the, the principles, if you like, the, the the values that sit at the top of that triangle and help guide us and lead us to a place that we want to be at so we can say we all have values uh some of us might be religious we might express our values in in, in different ways but can we communicate them exactly can we communicate exactly what they are and and does it matter if you know can we live up to them are we hypocrites if we don't you know how 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 do we work with our own values so there's the first thing that you can take and think about and consider from yourself is about the values that you use to guide yourself in your life. Now, 
I like to tell stories. And I like to make the this PDC really real for you. And part of it is the journey that I have been on, and I hope I can share that with you. So <clears throat> I um, was lucky enough to go to university in the 1980s, and I did a degree in sustainable development. It's kind of a mixture of ecology and economics. And it, that's what's led me to permaculture. Um, I graduated in 84 and I had a chance to travel. I spent a bit of time in India. I came back to UK and I worked on a development education project for a few years. And I also did some work working with trees and in nature. Um, I'd come from a farming background, so I like to work outside. And then in the late 80s, very towards the end of the 80s, um, I traveled to Africa and I spent some time in various places, starting off in Kenya and ending up in Zimbabwe. And it was in Zimbabwe I came across permaculture and I started to realize, you know, there really were meaningful ways to achieve a sustainable development, not just words, but practices. Like I say, this idea of the this ethics, principles and design tools, this can really work. Anyway, 1995, um, I settled down, stopped traveling uh, the world and started a permaculture community and tried to start to work very much and very seriously within these ideas. I settled in Wales and I took a job at an environment centre, which was called the Centre for Alternative Technology, cat.org.uk. You'll, you'll find them on the internet. Very interesting organisation, started in the 1970s, exploring what it might be like to live a kind of, if you like, within ecological constraints. Um, <clears throat> OK, so I picked up this book in 1995, about the time when I... You know, I'd done my studying, I'd done my traveling, and now here I was really trying to engage with the world in the, you know, in the, in the, uh, the subject area, in the domain I had studied, sustainable development. Okay, sorry. Um, here we go. So, interesting book. And as I was just looking through it the other day, um, I saw of these a series of quotes and, and summaries in there, which I thought was a good place to start this course. So David Reed, writing in 1995, said, sustainable development is the catchphrase of the 90s. Governments around the world, international institutions, local organisations and NGOs have committed themselves to its principles and adopted policies to promote it. But sustainable development is difficult to define, let alone implement, and advocates and proponents may all interpret it in very different ways. And this is this is sort of our paradox, isn't it? People have been talking now about sustainability for a long time, 30 years at least, um, and yet the idea sort of becomes more nebulous and less defined, so it seems to me. And here we are, in 2022, heading into 23, still struggling with massive environmental issues. And clearly the world has kept investing in non-sustainable paths of development. This is why we need permaculture. This is why we need to bring about change. So John Ruskin, this quote from 18. 49. I don't claim to know lots about him, but I do understand that he was an early writer um, about the environment, uh, uh, someone who cared about, who could see the impacts that the Industrial Revolution was having on the landscape. So he was in the UK. 1849 would have been the peak of the you know, first phase of what would have been 100 years in to the Industrial Revolution, steel smelting and, 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 and you know, heavy industry John Ruskin said God has lent us the earth for our life it is a great entail it belongs as much as those 
to come who come after us and whose names already written in the book of creation as to us we have no right by anything that we do or neglect to involve them in unnecessary penalties or to deprive them of benefits that is written within our power to bequeath benefits within our power to bequeath we need to leave pass on the world to pass on the earth the natural world in a better state than what we found it not in a depleted eroded state that's what john ruskin said in 1849 let's jump to the more uh, 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 present day uh, dialogues about sustainability this is from uh, Barry Commoner. He says, when any environmental issue is probed to its origins, it reveals an escapable truth that the root cause of the crisis is not to be found in how men interact with nature, but in how they interact with each other. That to solve the environmental crisis, we must solve the problem of poverty, racial injustice and war. That the debt to nature, which is the measure of the environmental crisis, cannot be paid person by person in recycled bottles or ecologically sound habits, but in the ancient coin of social justice. Wow, that's quite a statement. And let's just savour those words and think about what he's saying, that we have to resolve conflict between ourselves. Uh, before we're going to resolve our conflict with the natural world. That we need to focus on social justice issues. Powerful stuff. Tell me what you think. This is what Barry Commoner is saying. Look him up. Find out more about the background of the statement. These are important ideas. <clears throat> Aldo Leopold, that's another quote taken from the Sustainable Development book. We abuse the land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see the land as a community to which we belong, we begin to use it with love and respect. The natural world is not there for us to own and to, to destroy. We have to understand that we're part of it. I think this, this statement uh, gives an insight into perhaps how many of our ancestors, First Nation people, uh, may think think about the, the natural world. Um, somehow in the Western development models and the industrial relevant uh, 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 development models, we've come to see the, the land as, as something outside of us that we can indeed see as commodity. This is what's causing our problems. Manfred Max Neve, he said, any fundamental human need that not is not satisfied reveals in poverty. This is quite a key statement, and we're going to be unpacking that and uh, referring back to this as we go through this lecture. Uh, as I understand it, Manfred Max Neve uh, is um, uh, 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 an academic in the world of sustainability who fundamentally believes that we can transform the world by addressing the needs of the poor, by empowering the vast majority of people who are reveling in poverty. And again, very interested to hear your thoughts about that and how let, let us explore to see how permaculture ideas can indeed help meet fundamental human needs and lessen the poverty that we are experiencing. E.F. Schumacher was a chancellor in uh, Germany. I think it was West Germany still in those days. And was an early um, a proponent of, is that right? Uh, uh, early proponent of, of sustainable development and, and wrote a, a very important book called Small is Beautiful. Call a thing immoral or ugly, soul-destroying, or a degradation of man, a peril to the peace of the world, 
or to the well-being of future generations. As long as you, as long as you have not shown it to be uneconomic, you have not really questioned its right to exist, grow and prosper. Clearly he's saying is, we seem to be allowed, anything that we regard as economic profit-making um, seems to go ahead regardless of the morality, the uh, environmental impact of, of, of that form of development. This is why we need ethics and values at the heart of our decision-making systems, not just profit-seeking short-termism. That's what E.F. Schumacher is saying. John Muir, when we try and pick out anything by itself, we find it to be hitched to everything else in the universe. Everything is connected to everything else. That's the thing. Uh, reductionist view of the natural world is very simplistic because it is all interconnected. And permaculture really tries to embrace that idea. And I think we're going to really bring that to life for you through the PDC. So these opening thoughts really give you something to, some questions to consider. Uh, here's something that someone said to me once, many years ago. If you don't stand for something, you might fall for anything. I think there's a lot of truth in that, is if you're really certain about who you are, what your values are, and what your objectives are, and what you're prepared to do, and how you're prepared to achieve your objectives, then you can't be easily fooled. You can't be easily cheated. Um, it's when you want the easy, get quick, you know, short answers, immediate success. Often then that's what you get led astray. Permaculture is something we can stand for and something we can define and um here's a picture of myself with uh sector 39 team members vicky uh godfrey and gerald uh in our lovely green t-shirts and uh we are in this picture uh from 2018 working with south sudanese uh, families who have been displaced uh, and arrived in northern uganda um thinking about how we can come together in adversity to meet each meet our needs and help each other meet our needs. That's what permaculture is for. How we need, meet our needs really matters. Well, look at this uh, wonderful image I found on the internet uh, when I was researching the other day. Um, seeing a knight in armor what's this here look at this with a lance i'm seeing an elephant with grand people on the back another one behind it and uh english gentlemen officers in their lovely red tunics um maybe he's giving some money to this boy or, and we're seeing this is clearly in india and this is at a time of the raj when uh when britain was great when britain was an imperial uh nation and and we were told we were filled with ideas as children. Oh, look, I think they're standing on, oh, no, that's on, on, is that a mat or a railway line? Um, anyway, <clears throat> as children here growing up in the UK, we were filled with ideas that uh, Britain was this great nation that helped civilise the world and, and, and spread technologies and, and uh, political ideas and, and, and development and brought industrialization to the world. Well... Some of those things are true, and we could think about what that really means. But the reality of it is Britain sucked enormous wealth out of India and invested it back into the UK and then used its position to tighten laws, to strangle competition from Indian businesses and to force India to become uh, a market for British goods. Um, recently, historians have put a number on that, and they're talking about 45 trillion pounds of wealth removed from India and invested in Britain. It was theft. It was done on the British terms for British objectives. 
Some parts of India's society maybe benefited from that, but most didn't. And it triggered enormous poverty, uh, uh, hunger, uh, famine, or terrible things happened because of the imbalances created by this. So clearly, this is a form of development that is not fair. It's also not sustainable because of it's such a one way imbalance. And it's it, it's it's taken growing up from within from this side in the developed world. It's taken us. We're not educated about the negative impacts of this. We're a little bit brainwashed. It's taken, you know, it's taken years to really understand how unjust the colonial imperial system was. And those of you in Kenya and Uganda are still echoing and feeling the long-term economic resonances of, of what was an unfair trading system. So this is a fairly bleak looking slide. It's just something I picked up on Facebook or somewhere. And it's a critique of capitalism. And it's saying the interesting thing about capitalism is that it's entirely incompatible with the future. So we've just decided to get rid of the future and keep capitalism for a short while. I mean, that's the paradox, isn't it? If we don't value the natural world, uh, if we just see it as something to be extracted and exploited, ultimately it's going to collapse. It's not leading us anywhere. And in some ways, the same view is the same way perhaps as the colonists felt in previous centuries, that it was okay just to grab resources from elsewhere and bring them home for our use without really considering the long-term impact of that. Globalized capitalism, especially this sort of modern neoliberal form, it's turned everything into a commodity, something that can be bought and consumed. You know, the very soil we depend on, whole ecosystems, swallowed up by these short-term notions of development. And of course, the very people themselves become expendable. This is, and so I, I, I ask the question, are we at the end of a paradigm, of this exploitative, way of thinking because i think i am tempted to think that the only way forward is to really is to evolve past it and come up with something very different and i also suspect that we're going to have to be the engineers and the leaders of this process because those vested within the existing system are not going to be able to do that um so, I mean, one of my thoughts about permaculture is, can it be a unifying force for, for the change that we need to see in the world? Okay, so this is an interesting guy, David Suzuki. He's, he's a Japanese, Canadian, uh, an academic, a science broadcaster. Um, I think he was an environmental activist from very young, but he's one of, the, he's one of those people who's communicated science very well. And certainly in uh, North America, in certain circles, he's, he's very well known and highly regarded. Um, I don't know exactly his CV, but it's people like David Suzuki um, and that generation of people who have helped engineer things like the World, um, the, the Earth Summit of 1992 and, and, and helped set up things like the Interglobal Panel on Climate Change. Um, ways in which we can find true paths to sustainable development. David says this, the way we see the world shapes the way we treat it. If we see a mountain as a deity and not a pile of ore, or a forest as a, as a sacred grove, something living and vested with, with life, not just timber, or we see other species, um, as, as our biological kin, not just resources. We see the planet as our mother, not just an opportunity. And we will treat each other with a greater respect. This is the challenge, to look at the world from a different perspective. I'm inviting you to look at the world from a different perspective, to look at it through the eyes of David Suzuki and, and, and be informed by these critiques, these statements that we've we've come across. I'm not saying you have to embrace every word, 
I'm challenging you to think about what they're saying, what they're implying, because this is this is a lot of what informs why we need permaculture. So, as I said, I don't know exactly what David Suzuki has done, but people of his generation have contributed to really this first phase of what sustainable development is. So as those of you younger may have uh, forgotten this, but in the build up to 2000, the world was, had the millennium fever. We were all so excited. Again, thinking about 1995, that was that that, 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 that we looked at. Um, imagine as we were moving to 2000, many people wanted to see that as um, a watershed moment. Can we use the, the millennium um, as a way to really commit to our evolution and to sustainable development. What were the millennium development goals to be achieved by the millennium have morphed into the SDGs, just the general sustainable development goals as, as defined by the United Nations. And the idea is that this should be the objectives of development is the 17 of them. Um, they're shown here as like a jigsaw puzzle and you can see how they're interlocking. Uh, and that is because clearly we have to solve this problem as a whole, not piecemeal. So this isn't like a little smorgasbord or something. This isn't something we can just pick. I'll have number three, number 10 and number 17, please. This is an all in thing, okay? So we need to consider from all of these. And actually, to my mind, they, they conflate together. And it's interesting that number one, which very much relates to the, the quote that I shared with you um, earlier, sustainable development goal, number one, no poverty. Let me just go back, here we are. Any fundamental need that is not satisfied reveals in poverty. So when we say no poverty, that means meeting fundamental needs. Now, let's think about what those might be. We'll come on to that. Um, number two is zero hunger. Well, food is a fundamental need. So I think it's good perhaps to be implicit about this, but poverty includes zero hunger. So we're fighting poverty. Good health and well-being. Well, again, is bad health and bad well-being is a function of poverty and creates poverty. So through zero hunger um, and number four through quality education we can have good health and well-being and we can come together to challenge poverty so these things really do sit together uh, number five gender equality we need to value the contribution from every member of our communities and understand that men and women may have slightly different roles and contribute in slightly different ways but within that there is an equality and a respect which is essential. Clean water and sanitation. Well, I sit that with very much part of the no poverty. Um, but perhaps to have clean water and sanitation, <clears throat> we need to address wider, bigger issues around pollution and, and, and so forth. Seven, affordable and clean energy. Okay, we've got a picture of a sun there with, with a, an on button on it. Um, solar power, clean for the Okay, number eight is a slightly complicated one, and I don't hundred percent agree with it. It says decent work and economic growth. I'm not sure what they mean by economic growth, because if we grow the kind of economy that we have any further, we're definitely going to cause ecological collapse. So let's just question a little bit what we mean by that. But we understand we all need decent, meaningful work and to be able to make a living so that we are not in poverty. OK, we get that much. Nine. Nine sits very closely with eight. It says industry, innovation and infrastructure. Yeah, we need whatever the roads, the buildings, the Internet connectivity, the, 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 the tools of the trade to have a functioning economy. But I think we need to also really understand and think about how work economy and infrastructure how that impacts on the environment so these things can't sit outside of our wider goal for sustainability 
reduced inequalities number 10 okay that's another people thing we talked about gender inequality there are many other in inequalities between different nations different tribes different cultures different countries let's think about that uh, uh and again think about how permaculture really pushes us to drives us towards an inclusive society one that values the contributions of everyone and therefore can benefit from from the contributions of everyone sustainable cities and communities <clears throat> i forget what year it was now around 2000 became the point in time when humans we became urban uh, more humans live in cities than do in the countryside in many ways cities have the potential to be very sustainable and very resource efficient the fact that they're not doesn't mean that they, they can't be it's again we haven't applied the right rationale the right kind of planning in our cities and we've allowed them to become a sprawling mess that has a huge ecological footprint these can be these things can be addressed and we'll uh, certainly be looking at permaculture in, in the city um, <clears throat> as part of our permaculture design course responsible consumption and production we have the figure of eight there on its side that is the uh, recognized symbol for infinity the idea of cycling resources endlessly rather than using them uh, digging them up, using them once and throwing them away. We've got to move to a circular economy. 13, climate action. All very well to say it. How do we do it? Life below water. Any pollution we cause on land ends up in the sea, ends up in our waterways. That has a massive effect. Um, life on land, obviously, how we behave with the, how we treat the land greatly relates to the water we have to stop using waterways as sewers and uh, refuse areas um what gets me about these 17 sustainable development goals is doesn't really tell us how we're going to achieve them it's all very well saying no poverty zero hunger how do we do that where are the resources if we look at 16 and 17 maybe get a clue Peace, justice, and strong institutions. Where are those strong institutions for peace and justice? I'm ready for it. We, we, we you know, the United Nations and all these sort of other global organizations, you know, I think we need many, many, many more. We need institutions of all sizes and um, accessible to everyone. And which leads us into 17, partnerships for these goals. We've got to work together. We have to create Strong institutions for peace and justice that interlink from local to regional to national to global and, and back again <clears throat> so that we all feel included, need to be included, empowered uh, through reduced inequality, through tackling gender inequality, through empowering people by removing poverty. Then that's how big changes happen. So. These are the United Nations SDGs and interlocking, um, showing really that this idea of sustainable development touches on every area of life. There are social things, there are economic things, there are, uh, uh, you know, sort of natural world things there, um, which all integ integrate together. So <clears throat> permaculture doesn't disagree with this. We just express it slightly differently and maybe emphasize things slightly yeah. differently. So talking about world issues and long-term trends and fighting climate change, it's all a bit overwhelming. Where do we start? Well, we start with one's self. That's you, okay? Permaculture begins with the self. Here we see this nice little, this little uh, image. Um, to ourselves, we're the most interesting person. We're the most fascinating person. Um, and we're also the person who best understands ourself and, and knows what we need. And um, so let's say, I think, clearly 
part of our own responsibility is to, to bring about sustainable development, is to think about ourselves. What? How do we meet our needs? What are our personal needs? What are our priorities and what are our objectives? What are we trying to do? Think about it. Make some notes. Clearly, we're not individuals. In this little graphic, we can see the individual surrounded by many, many other people. So within this thinking about how we meet our needs, we also need to understand that there's a balance between oneself and the other people around us. We have to balance that. And it, one of the ways, the most effective ways that we can meet our needs, uh, whatever they are, is by building strategies with and, and, and partnerships with people around us. And permaculture says, look, if we can build plans and strategies for not just the short term, for medium and long term goals, and we can collaborate with people around us, then we have every chance of achievement and moving forward and creating something we can build on. So permaculture begins with you. All of these ideas around big ideas around the world and sustainable development and the climate, put all that into the background. It begins with you and it empowers you. It puts you into the driving seat and understands that um, the, the more we can begin to define what our own priorities are, then we're better placed we are to achieve them. Okay, now I'm going to take a, a very short break and um, I can find how to do that. Get back in one minute. Okay, so. We're saying our permaculture journey begins with oneself. So the first thing we start to think about is think about, about your own personal needs, priorities, objectives. What do I want to get from this course? What how do I, you know, going through life? Um, what do I need and what you know, what might be by longer term goals that I might want to get from this. Um, so here's my little, we've had the preamble. This is really the ethics lecture about ethics and poem culture. And what we've done is we've, we've been on a journey through sustainable development. We've seen what sort of global uh, governmental objectives are. We've heard thoughts on sustainable sustainability from different uh, leading authors uh, going back to the 90s. And now we're going to jump and go into um, bring it right up to date. And let's just say this pink circle, that represents you. That represents um, what your own needs might be. And... I put a little um, statement there, which actually I put my signature underneath, because I think this is really, this is the key, key, key idea in permaculture. Very, very important. Before we can work together effectively, we need to have an ethical framework we can agree on and be able to communicate that to others. This is the starting point for permaculture design. What do I mean by that? Well, if this is you, if this represents you and your needs, what you, what you what you need is where are those inputs coming from? You know, what might they be? What inputs, resources, and information do you need to affection to to function effectively? A reminder: it's not selfish to prioritize your own needs, providing we set limits to consumption. That means don't be greedy. We're also going to ask you to think about what is the difference between a want and a need. So we're talking essentially about needs. What inputs do we need? Well, from our previous example, um, 
under the colonial system, Great Britain and people within it were happy to meet their needs by plundering resources and importing resources from outside and from not considering the long-term consequences of doing that. That's what I mean about we need to have some ethics in common if we're going to be able to work together because we don't want to do that. We've got to move on from that. Um, so the first thing is be beginning to be aware of, of course, we all need inputs. We need food and shelter and clothing and information and for just whatever it is. You know, Think about what they are and where they come from. And think about are they things, how essential those things are. So this is our first thought. It's about how we meet our needs. And what I'm saying here, what permaculture model is saying is, look, it's really fine to prioritize yourself, but there comes a point where, oh, maybe I've had enough. Maybe I can use what I have to build alliances with other people. So a guy called uh, Maslow, um, who was, I don't know, some kind of... Um, philosopher i guess thinker anyway he created this model which he called a hierarchy of needs and he what he's saying is very clearly is that we might need all of these things but they come in order and the certain things that we just simply cannot do without he called these these physiological needs um things that we literally cannot survive without and number one air we have to breathe every few seconds we breathe without that everything else obviously we pass out and ultimately die so everything else is somehow less important and less significant than having an air supply and ideally the air supply was clean and unpolluted and um, enables us to carry to, to flourish as an individual we need water we need food we need warmth or cool. We, uh, we need rest. We need shelter. Uh, we need to be able to sort of recharge ourselves. Without those really basic, fundamental, you know, practical needs being met, nothing else matters. So imagine, you know, you're a refugee or a displaced person. Maybe you've lost um, your things. You, you're frightened. You're hungry. You're cold. You're naked, you know, you don't even have a blanket, um, somewhere to rest, somewhere to get out of the extreme weather. In that situation, nothing else matters. You're right, you're brought right into the present. You're trying to resolve those problems, you know, as quickly as you can and almost to the exclusion of all else. Once we've met our immediate physiological needs, we then can begin to think a little bit more longer term and a little bit more beyond ourselves, not thinking a little bit about others. So we need security and safety. We need to build, um, you know, have a degree of stability around us. And again, we might do that by forming relationships with the people around us so that we can um, begin to build systems to help meet our needs. And so that we can feel a little bit less, more uh, security, less uh, um, exposure in the situation that we're in. So again, is to think about how one sits on top of the other. And as we can build these relationships, we can then begin to build, to create and can be concerned by longer term, very, very important things, but not as important as breathing and drinking water, which is, you know, our friendships, our intimate relationships, the feeling of belonging, um, what uh, Maslow called our psychological needs to be, you know, mentally healthy and, and so forth. It, it is more than just food and water and basic safety. Um, once we have those things, we really crave stronger friendships you know, partners, love interests, um, but a sense of belonging, community that come from those interactions. So you could almost imagine as we move from the safety needs from the green level into this belonging, it's the more we interact with each other to secure our feeling of safety, from that comes longer term friendships, intimacy, and, 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 so, and, and the sense of belonging. These are very, very human things, but they come in a sequence. 
Now, the next level, this blue one is really interesting, is esteem needs, prestige, feeling of accomplishment. Well, how about jobs? We get a strong sense of self, self-confidence, of status, es esteem comes from, I've got a job, I'm a teacher, I earn this much money every month. Um, I have a feeling of accomplishment. I've worked hard to get to where I am. And now I'm, you know, feeling the benefit of that. Again, very real and very important things. And here's the thing. Here's the thing I was thinking about is here in the West, very much in our culture, maybe the same in yours. We kind of ignore the bottom three and we just go straight for the esteem needs. We go for the job. And we're told is the way that you meet your needs in this world is you get yourself a job and with that comes your prestige and feeling of accomplishment and you get a wage. And with that wage, you can buy food, water, warmth, rest, security, safety. And uh, with that, build friends and relationships and get uh, intimate friends and everything else that, that, that we've talked about. That the job comes first. OK. That's OK in a highly developed, uh, secure economy. Maybe that is OK. But the problem then comes is what if you don't have a job? We're trying to get a job. We're knocking on the door. Don't have the qualifications. Oh, job uh, available uh, you know, isn't available right now. Then we have nothing. Then we're left hanging. And that's a situation which we see a lot of here in the UK is people maybe have jobs and homes and then they might lose them. They fall out of that system and they have nothing. They literally in the street with nothing, freezing to death, you know, whatever, many facing many, many challenges and losing their prestige and losing their feeling of accomplishment, which leaves you utterly devastated. You do see, you know, derelict people maybe using alcohol and drugs and, and, and who knows what to try and sustain themselves because they've lost prestige and feeling of accomplishment, because they're feeling enormous insecurity, and, and, and quite rightly so, if they've lost their home and their safety. Um, so I think power culture is kind of implying that if we can build up from the bottom, maybe not producing all of our own food or, 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 or so forth, but the more of it that we can source ourselves and locally and through community, the more secure that is, whether we have a job or not, whether we have disposable income or not. Um, if we know how to filter rainwater through sand and through other materials to make it clean so we can drink it, it means that we can meet our own needs directly without having to buy bottled water. So now you can see as we move up the hierarchy, our... Um, our concerns can be much broader and much more longer term. So, okay, I've got some, I've fed, I'm watered, I've got somewhere warm and safe to sleep tonight, I've got my friends, I've got my sense of security, uh, I've got my job, I've got my career, then I can then begin to think, what can I do next? Maybe I can, you know, I don't know, go into politics or write a book or become a professor or, I don't know, <laughs> retire and become the grandparent that you always wanted to be. Whatever your long-term kind of ultimate goal is, the self-fulfillment. Um, you know, Maslow felt that that was something that perhaps we were all potentially moving towards. You know, maybe you don't. But it's an interesting model. And I think my point is, within permaculture, we really have to have a sense of priority and order. And some things really are more important than others. And once we've got those fundamentals in place, we really do have a strong foundation and platform with which to move forward. So ethics in permaculture. We talked about the self, how we meet our own needs. We talked about that at some point we have to begin then to, well, this is it. This is when we have to ask ourselves how we're going to balance our priorities of ourselves and that then of other people of family, of community, you know, the rest of the world. Um, can we consider our relationships with other people? Are we in competition with those people? Or could we find ways to collaborate? Can we create more mutually beneficial relationships through 
working together, absolutely planning together and designing together, creating visions that perhaps we can all feel we can, you know, buy into. Um, so the question is, if 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 the pink circle is is me and you, oneself, uh, the brown circle in this example is other people, and look how they're touching. Can we overlap? Can we bring those together more? Can we um, see that there might be ways in which we might work to meet our needs, but that also serve and benefit the wider community, and that in turn benefits us. So here's a thought: is what 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 would be in this this overlap area for you? Can you think of ways to build mutually beneficial relationships between yourself? and your community you know sharing ideas around permaculture is a way um i'm sure that you interact with each other in many ways in your community but we can do it strategically with more purpose with more intent um with a greater sense of design we can achieve more so on we go the first set of ethics is around ourselves and how we meet our needs. Second set of the second ethic is around recognizing that other people um, are also doing the same. They're trying to meet their needs, and we don't have to be in competition. We can collaborate, and in fact, collaboration creates more possibility. So we're, our ethics are going to interact with each other, and also by setting limits by not being too greedy ourselves, we can realize. We might have spare resource, whether it's time, money, seed, food, whatever. Uh, we can share those to build relationships across our community. So the third area, the third ethic, is to do with the natural world. Same as we sort of uh, saw in the in the in the UN SDGs, um, we have to think about our relationship to the natural world, and that that, that relationship with the natural world also kind of overlaps with our relationship with community. And um, I think it's very important to explore how these three things interact. Self, other people, the nature. Okay, here's an interesting model. This is not mine, uh, one I picked up. It's, it's permaculture. It is expressing, sorry, the permaculture kind of the same kind of ethics, but in a, I think this is just a sustainable development model. Uh, but it's interesting to see how it explores it. And, and this important idea that, okay, so the self, the decisions that we make about how we meet our needs, we could see as trading. And we give some of our time out and we with that we get money and with that we win the other resources that we need. So in this model, it says people, planet and profit. So other people, natural world and something to do with economy, something to do with economic variables, variables that in some ways we need to run our lives as some kind of an energy profit because we're growing. Um, if we give out more than we get back, we will slowly die. Um, so in the same way as we might look at if you like an enterprise, but if you like, is we, we could um, think about ourselves in, in the same way. And look, it's it's kind of named the 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 overlap. So I thought this was interesting just to bring into our model. And so if I here's a thought about our individual actions in our sort of the economic sphere and how our economic actions might interact with with other people is it's describing this area where it's mutually beneficial it's equitable that means it's fair so we might be trading with other people selling goods and services to other people we might be employing other people we want that to be an equitable relationship it's fair for both sides mutually beneficial um that our relationship between how we meet our needs and the planet needs to be viable. That means not running down natural resources faster than they can be replaced. And uh, the, the interaction between the rest of the world, people and the planet 
also needs to be oh, viable, bearable. And, and in this model, it's suggesting that if we can hit the middle of this model more often than not, that we're then beginning to be really sustainable because it's economically sustainable, it's socially sustainable, and it's ecologically sustainable. So this, all of these ideas, we have to bring into our permaculture ethical model. So um, here it is. It's the social, it's the environmental, and it's the ethic economic sphere. And if we can find strategies that somehow sit that benefit all three, then we're really, I would actually go beyond sustainable and I would say it's regenerative. It's something that is rebuilding. So in permaculture, we like we say say it slightly differently. We talk about care for the earth, preserving ecosystems, valuing the natural world for its own sake. Um, not just valuing a species because we might be able to exploit it, but understanding it's part of a wider system. Every species has its place and contributes in its own way. Care for the earth, earth care. Care for people, look after ourselves, look after our family, look after our community. Understand that other people are only doing the same as what we are, which is seeking to meet our needs. And the final area, this economic area, um, this personal area. So it says, set limits to consumption, redistribute surplus. Well, who gets to say who sets the limit? What is surplus? Well, that's for you to decide. This isn't supposed to be a dictatorial system. This is for us to understand our own needs, understand what is essential, and realise that what isn't essential potentially a surplus and we can use that surplus to build our relationship with other people with community and clearly also to the natural world so we say earth care people care fair share that or care of the earth care of people fair share it's a way of remembering it um, but really i want you to know that really these simple statements contain all of these ideas that we've just talked about now Here's another model, society, economy, nature, same things. Um, here, you put in some ideas of what might be components of those things. So um, a stable and resilient investment, consistent yields relying on diversity of crops and buildup of natural capital. That would be a very good way to meet our personal needs poverty alleviation meeting basic needs on a personal community level promotion of a layered approach to finance you can explore these ideas on your own time i am interested so look this is the, the thing the one that perhaps we should most look at is the one in the middle is where earth care people care fair share come together and it says a better tomorrow by addressing the key issues of our time from a multitude of approaches, permaculture provides a framework for truly sustainable development. That's how we get there. That's how we get there. It, it, the permaculture doesn't just give us the uh, just the statements end poverty. It actually gives us the tools and starts to suggest the strategies that we might use to address these long term challenges. So I'm going to take this one step further and remembering that this key thing is within the economic paradigm, within the, 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 the social, the personal, sorry, the personal, um, the fair share. It's this idea of setting limits to consumption and reinvest, reinvesting surplus. So look, I've used the same colours. The pink is still you. That's you and the decisions you make. But rather than having overlapping, I put one within the other because actually, as individuals, we're all a subset of a wider society. We're not overlapping with it. We're within it. And our society as a whole is sits within the natural world. 
and is constrained by natural limits. So I, I think it's a, having gone on this journey, I think we arrived at a place where we see ourselves embedded within community, a community in, embedded within the natural world. And understanding that the decisions we make as an individual will impact and contribute to our community in different ways. And then the collective impact of the community really defines and becomes our relationship with the natural world. So this is, I think, empowering it makes us realize as individuals our own thoughts and actions really matter and are impactful so let's go back to the sdgs and I, as i was saying at the beginning of them some you can kind of lump them together a bit or realize that they're aspects of the same thing so i was interested to see the sdgs in a, again using the same model as we just looked at before is um let's see it's three layers economy society environment and understanding that taking care of the land taking care of things on water uh uh looking after climate change and uh whatever that one was um these are actual limits um the natural world has boundaries and we have to pay attention to those boundaries. We carry on polluting, we carry on deforesting, we carry on um, uh, you know, changing the atmosphere of the planet and, and fueling climate change is we will come undone because every part of our society is dependent on and relates to the natural world. So all of our, our, our goals of Quality, education, health, food, uh, ending poverty, uh, peace and justice. These are all folded into society. So we can group those um, aspirations in the middle. And then when we go back to, to the economy, it's around uh, jobs and infrastructure and the tools that we need. Um, having a cyclical, a cyclical economy and equality so that um, every individual is empowered to create wealth and, and, and contribute to their own well-being and consequently just to wider society's well-being within a healthy natural world. So this is how I like to think of the ethics. They sit within each other. So this top level is around you, how you meet your needs, the world of work, um, and, and, and whether you have, how you have access to those things, all of those are abs absolutely key. Um, second layer about, well, other people, but also about society, about because we, we're also participating in society. And as a whole, uh, we can hold these values and, and, and operate within them. But we absolutely need to understand that everything about what we do is a subset of the natural world. And by that, I mean the air, the soils, forests, rivers and seas. We have to um, obey and work to, to these um, realities. And again, it's, that's why I say, if we let nature be our teacher, what does it teach us? Well, we are allowing understanding in permaculture. We are understanding, accepting that we are defined by an uh, a relationship to this natural world. So, if nature can be our teacher, we can reform society and we can modify our own behaviours so that we contribute to that process. And ultimately, it's only about feeding yourself and your own family. So, here we go. It's earth care. It's people care. It's meet one's own needs, reinvest surplus. Let's call that fair share. And let's see fair share as an economic tool. So fair share, people care, earth care. These are the permaculture ethics. These are the things I want you to take on board and understand that everything that we teach on this course um, going forward sits within this ethical framework about how we achieve these as long-term goals. Economy, society, nature. 
And it's good to notice, actually, that there's a joint, joint fast task force on sustainable development. And I'm seeing lots of logos there. No idea who they are. But we can see how, again, is that collaboration. That was the uh, uh, SDG 17 coming together to work for peace and justice. That's what we're doing. That's why we run this course. That's why I'm, I'm here talking to you now. Earth care, people care, fair share. Okay, thank you very much for attention. Uh, that's the end of this session, and we will be discussing this and issues raised by it on our Zoom chat, which will be on uh, Tuesday evening. Thank you very much.